good morning and welcome back to the lecture series on narrative mode and fiction. So, we are continuing our discussion today on magical realism. Magical realism uh, combines realism and the fantastic in such a way that the magical elements grow organically out of the reality that is being portrayed. So, according to John Updike, magical realism is a now a widely available elixir, an important component of postmodernism as well. Uh, Homi Baba refers to magical realism as, I quote Baba, the literary language of the emergent postcolonial world, unquote. Whereas for Mati Kalinescu, it can be, I quote, a major perhaps the major component of postmodernist fiction, unquote. Latin American authors have frequently read uh, this uh, genre of uh, magical realism as a, a tool of political subversion. Salman Rushdie's uh, Midnight's Children uh, exemplifies this mode of magical realism. It is not set in Latin America. Uh, it is talking about the juxtaposition of the magical and the real and the wonder that emerges out of uh, this this kind of uh, mishmash. Uh, so the uh, genre is uh, very much set in the South Asian context in the newly independent India um, and through etching telepathic and marvelous connections and uh, shuffling and reshuffling predestined meanings. Rushdi, uh, redefines the post-colonial Indian nation as a, a magically imagined uh, community. So, this is very much uh, in tandem with what we have read in Benedict Anderson's uh, notion of imagined communities that he uh, wants to argue a nation is. Uh, this is very much present in Salman Rushdie's uh, Midnight's Children. Wendy B. Farris uh, would note that the seed of Shehrazade's children uh, underlines and informs the uh, postmodern uh, conditions that are uh, available that inform Midnight's children. So, we also see that uh, in 1001 uh, Arabian Nights or Persian Nights, there is this uh, tendency of you know, story leading to the story, the, the complex uh, narration that we have. Shehrazade, the central character, is a popular paradigm of the uh, high modernist narrator who is uh, completely exhausted and threatened uh, by death, but still trying to be inventive, trying to be uh, clever and creative. Shehrazade uh, represents the cause of all. Uh, virgins across time and space whom uh, the father is sending to King Sharir, uh, King Sharir being a man who wants to assuage his disillusionment at his wife's uh, infidelity by uh, sleeping with a new woman every night and then uh, putting her to death uh, in the morning. So, Shehrazade as a way of deferring her death. Uh, in a very Deridian sense, differing the final meaning, differing any final decision, uh, begins to tell stories to the king, stories that are embedded in each other. So, the king has to wait until the next night uh, in order to hear the end of a tale. A tale, a tale always ends uh, midway when it is, when the dawn is about to break. So, and by the time it's next morning already. Shehrazade has embedded one story uh, into another. So, this story is not complete without knowing the next one. The king cannot bear to kill her because he is uh, genuinely curious. He has got a hang of uh, listening to Shehrazade's stories. And this way, we see Shehrazade surviving for a thousand and one nights. By this time, she has given birth to three children. And um, at this point, uh, she confronts the king. After three years have uh, elapsed, she tells the king 
about her situation and then he relents, he gives up his uh, disillusionment and the uh, associated punishment. So we see Sherazade survives by uh, being clever. Sherazade's clever style of spinning yarn of tales harkens back uh, Julia Christopher's notion of language as the ultimate fetish, yet also something that is constantly um, slipping away, a temporary slippery uh, zone that language is and yet something that is indispensable and a life preserver and, and something that constantly covers the lack which is inherent in uh, our relation with uh, the death and the abject. So, language as a way of differing the uh, final meaning that we must meet, um, that human conditions must meet, which is death. And, and Sherazade very cleverly tries to dodge, tries to, uh, you know, uh, push her death away by yet another day. This is, uh, you know, symptomatic of the, uh, the, the condition of the high modernist narrator. Narration uh, enables, uh, facilitates uh, and informs uh, individual survival, the narrator's survival. So, in their uh, embedded structure and, uh, you know, growing out of one another and continuing till 1001 nights, Sherazade's uh, tales point to the auto-generative nature of fictions and even that of the language, a characteristic that is uh, progressively uh, made more explicit in the uh, post Joyce uh, in the post Joycean age. So, a characteristic that is uh, progressively made more explicit in the post Joycean age. In Sherazade's tales, uh, just like in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, language uh, takes on magical properties. Uh, in order to light up the nights that are uh, verging on nightmares in which they are told. So, so the creativity and uh, the generativity of magical realist writing operates at all levels uh, in the fictions on the structure, uh, on, on the structural plane uh, with stories that grow out of other stories on the mimetic plane uh, with characters that duplicate uh, themselves in miraculous feats of uh, doubling and then we have the metaphorical register where images that take on lives of their own and engender uh, other images uh, beyond themselves are, are independent of their re referential world. So, and then we have the metaphorical register with images that take on lives uh, of their own and uh, engender or create other images beyond themselves uh, independent of their referential worlds. So, some of uh, the important postmodern artwork uh, that are considered uh, as uh, magical realist works include but are not limited to Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, Robert Pinget's oh, That Voice, Carlos Fuentes's Distant Relations, D. M. Thomas's The White Hotel, uh, the, then we have William Kennedy's Iron Weed, Patrick uh, Suskind's uh, Perfume, Toni Morrison's Beloved, uh, Laura Esquivel's Like Water for Chocolate, and Anna Castillo's So Far From God. So, other um, precursors and uh, contemporaries that one may recall in the context of uh, magical realism that is uh, are Gogol, uh, Kafka, Borges, Carpentier, uh, Paz, uh, Cortazar, uh, Calvino, Wilson Harris, uh, Alan Day and Ben Okri. Uh, having said that, uh, I would personally uh, read uh, Alejo Carpentier and Julio Cortazar as very much part of the magical realist tradition. They are postmodern writers, but also very much, uh, you know, invested into the idea of the uh, magical uh, realist creations. So, let us look at the uh, primary characteristics 
of magical realist uh, fiction. So the first thing that uh, comes to mind when talking about the magical realist uh, fiction is that the text contains an irreducible element of magic, uh, something one cannot explain according to the laws of the universe uh, as one knows them. So in terms of the text, magical things really do happen. So for example, in uh, distant religions, we have young Victor and uh, uh, Andre that really become uh, a, a twin fetus floating in a pool. In 100 years of uh, solitude, we have Remedios, the beauty uh, really ascend uh, heavenward. And in perfume, we have Grenuel uh, really distill a human scent from the bodies of virgins. So, then in Ironweed, we have Francis Fellon's uh, dead enemies really um, do hopping on the trolley that he is riding and speaking to him. So uh, the irreducible elements uh, in an existential fashion uh, keep uh, uh, sticking out and reminding that uh, they do exist, the magical uh, does exist. When seen from the perspective of uh, these elements themselves, so there, when seen from the perspectives of these elements themselves, there are remnants of existential anguish uh, at an, at, that we see in this, uh, uh, you know, this interface between the magic and the uh, real. For the magical elements, uh, the anguish comes from having space in this uncooptable world which is tempered um, and, and their anguish is uh, tempered by a more playful mood of surrealism. So when we see from the perspective of uh, these magical elements, the, there are remnants of existential anguish that emerges because of this uh, uncooptable world, how the magic can uh, sit on the real, uh, how do they interface uh, and this, uh, uh, you know, lack of compatibility between the two is tempered by a more playful mood of surrealism. So uh, as an example in uh, So Far From God, Anna Castillo confirms the irreducible nature of a dead person's uh, reappearance by verifying her uh, citing uh, from several people. And I quote, Esperanza was also occasionally seen. Yes, seen not only by La Loca, but also by Domingo, who saw her from the front window. At, and once, although she had thought at first it was a dream, Esperanza came and lay down next to her mother. Unquote. So, like the fleeting and momentary metaphors that repeatedly call attention to themselves as uh, metaphors, metaphoric presences, um, and thus remain partially unassimilated within the texture of the real narrative, the magic in these texts uh, refuse to be assimilated into the mundaneness. They do not completely diffuse and uh, merge with the mundane world. The magic also exists uh, symbolically in a, a foreign textual culture and setting as a disturbing element, something that the people are not used to, not habituated with, uh, something that cannot be foisted smoothly into the realism of that particular culture. So irreducible uh, magic often means disrupting the ordinary logic of cause and effect. Let us take the example of Midnight's Children. Salim's claims in Midnight's Children that he caused this or that historical event uh, by singing a song, by moving a paper pot on a dining table is a similar logical reversal where ordinary logic do not apply. So Melchiades's uh, manuscript uh, turns out to be a prediction rather than just a recording of events.
in 100 years of solitude. So, uh, it implicitly asks whether uh, we or anyone could be master of one's own fate or whether we are victims of our fate, right? Even though the reader uh, may remain skeptical in the face of the proposed sequences, the, the enormity of the historical events, the human suffering that is involved in these events and uh, the consequent uh, dissatisfaction one feels at the traditional ways in which such phenomena have been integrated and naturalized into our cultural logic. Uh, cause the reader to question such pre-given logic and want to believe in the magical realists uh, alternative new fictional arrangements. So, for example, the process of uh, colonization, the process of uh, you know domination of the non-white people by, by, by the uh, Europeans was uh, seen as natural till we have uh, uh, you know critics uh, you know the critics that are playing with words playing with form bringing in the magical to question and problematize the, uh, the assumptions uh, associated with uh, this entire world view or entire system of thought. Uh, so, uh, colonization is not let to remain as something uh, natural, racism is not let to remain as something natural. Uh, in the same way, magical realism, the magical realist techniques uh, through uh, this, this new objectivity uh, brings in question of uh, gendered bias, uh, especially focusing on the new world, the post-colonial world. So, all hierarchies uh, that engender uh, out of our old ways of seeing and, and believing are kind of shakened uh, by the magical realist techniques. Uh, in the light of reversals of logic and uh, the irreducible elements of magic, the real as we know uh, may be made to seem as a uh, amazing or even ridiculous, right? So, uh, when we have certain, uh, so, so magical realism is basically hitting at the uh, heart of, at the core of certain deadened uh, uh, assumptions, assumptions that we do not even discuss because uh, they are almost viscerally present in us. They could be based on religion or some uh, habits uh, put into us, uh, inculcated in us uh, through, uh, you know, mainstream institutions. So, magical realism uh, gives us the eye of the child and makes us understand and wonder how ridiculous, how absurd these institutions can be after a point. The reactions of ordinary people to these magical events reveal behaviors that uh, we recognize and that disturb us, right? We, we see something as magical, for example, when it does not follow the socially agreed upon uh, uh, norm, the normative way of being and thinking. So, for instance, uh, the magical treatment cracks open the artificiality of uh, institutions, like I said institutions such as religion, such as nation, all of which are uh, human artifacts, uh, you know, categories or institutions that do not have anything natural about them. Uh, and even language, uh, all of uh, these uh, also secure our basic fundamental identity. So, our identity uh, is put at stake in a certain sense by the uh, magical realist and postmodern artwork, right? So, we are rereading uh, our institutions, we are reconsidering our uh, uh, habits, our, our 
familiar space and beliefs uh, in a new light, in the light of new objectivity. And uh, this also, in a way, reminds me of something very important that uh, Hola Bakht says in mythologies. Um, uh, Bakht, who is a post structuralist, says that the system of uh, signification, right, uh, which, which uh, rules at the heart of uh, collective consciousness uh, is also responsible for the myths in any given society. So, how do the myths function? The myths are ascribing some uh, naturalness, some historical dimension to a ritual, to a uh, practice. These forms, these practices, it could be a marriage ritual, it could be a worshipping, it could be a death ceremony, they are all embedded in our society for generations, for ages and uh, after a point we do not question why we perform in a certain way in a given context. It could be a marketplace, it could be um, a, 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 a football match. So, he is interested in the uh, semiotics of these uh, different uh, public settings, let us say, or uh, different collective practices. And he says that uh, the, the relation between the form and the meaning or the signifier and the signified is uh, completely arbitrary. The rules of a football match are natural to the people that have grown up watching a football, but uh, to an outsider, a person who is an outsider to the game of soccer, it is a magic, it is, uh, it is at least something that defies interpretation, right. So, there is nothing natural about uh, the, the relationship between form and meaning uh, that uh, one, one bring together uh, to, to inform a myth in a given culture. So, the next feature of uh, magical realism, now we are going to move to the next feature of magical realism, which is uh, that descriptions lay out a strong presence of the phenomenal world. Uh, this is the realist part of magical realism. Like we know, realism is very fond of describing elaborately and we find the same also in magical realism. Uh, and, and this is precisely the quality or, or uh, let us say, the, the, the feature that distinguishes the uh, genre of magical realism from that of fantasy and allegory. Realist descriptions create uh, a fictional world which very much resembles with the one we live in. Uh, and in many uh, instances, it, it uh, very effectively makes use of uh, uh, details. There are extensive and uh, uh, elaborate uh, details uh, that describe uh, things and places and people. So, on the one hand, the attention uh, to the sensory, to the, this world uh, represents a continuation and even uh, to an extent renewal of the realistic tradition. Uh, on the other, uh, in magical realist fiction, uh, in addition to magical events, uh, let us say, uh, the appearance and reappearance of beloved or Francis Fellin's conversations with the dead uh, and even phenomena such as Melchiades' uh, manuscript, uh, Salim transmitting and receiving uh, radio head or even Grenuels' nose, all these details are themselves magical in nature. So, all of we are giving uh, details uh, and, and thereby emulating the realist tradition in, in the sense of the form. Uh, if we look at the content of these details, uh, they verge on the magical rather than the mundane and they entrance the reader through uh, magical descriptions and so through descriptions, we are not uh, embedding ourselves to this world. We are not uh, showing our loyalty to the mundane meanings, but we are uh, making a clear departure from realism. Descri uh, description 
apparently something the a quality that is associated with realism makes the magical real precisely what it is a departure from the mundane so the function of detailing is freed from a traditionally mimetic role to a large extent so so it is uh, true even when considering canonical realist texts from the Barthesian perspective uh, which questions uh, their mimetic qualities and treat details only as markers that do not give away uh, a lot of information uh, other than the fact that the story is real. Even from the, the understanding of the realist text in the Barthesian sense, we see that the magical details can serve as markers which are premised on uh, completely opposite uh, intentions and opposite directions signaling that the details are taking us in the domain of uh, the imaginary. So, for example, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's uh, rewriting of the history of uh, Latin America in the fictional town of Mekondo, including a massacre that has been elided from the public record from the formal history. Now, that is where magical realism comes from. The opening of Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, which restores a man airbrushed out of history by party doctrine. And in all these examples, we, so, so in all these instances, um, some of the elements of uh, magical realism uh, do draw on the mythical components, although uh, they are not one and the same. The combination of myth and magic implies, so eternal mythic truths or historical events are uh, what make up our collective memory. Like I said, the, the myths that uh, appear as history, they are part of the, they are essential components of the collective consciousness of a given society. Formation of histories, uh, in, so formation of histories can also include uh, magic and wisdom, folk wisdom, local uh, hearsays, uh, adages and uh, you know uh, the, the wise sayings. Uh, for example, even told from uh, Ursula's or Melchiades's point of view that we find in 100 years of solitude, right? So, history is not only about facts, but it uh, is enmeshed uh, in, in, in magic. It, it brings in qualities of, uh, uh, you know, wise sayings and, and uh, truisms and maxims too. So, history is the weight that uh, ties the balloon of magic uh, to the this world. So, once we add a historical dimension, the, the magic is uh, prevented from taking off and uh, it uh, in a way warns against too great a lightness of magical being that both Fuentes and Kundera include dangerous sets of floating uh, angels in their novels. So, history is the weight that uh, keeps the balloon of magic from taking off. It teeters the balloon of magic to the this worldly conditions as if, as if to warn against too great a lightness of uh, magical being. Uh, we see both Fuentes and Milan Kundera include dangerous sets of uh, floating uh, angels in their novels. Uh, we see in the, the book of laughter and forgetting these angels holding hands and dancing in a ring um, and not everyone can participate in, uh, in, in that, uh, you know, circular dance movement. Uh, it goes on to represent that kind of lightness, dangerous lightness that does not have a historical dimension to it uh, goes on to become 
a kind of lightness of uh, ahistorical irresponsibility, something that has no coordinates whatsoever with what uh, common people can identify with. So, magic not alone, but magic uh, wedded to reality. So, the ahistorical and dangerously unanchored position is symbolized through the twin fetus at the uh, end of Fuentes's novel, uh, Distant Relations, which are a remainder of old Heredia's desire to create an angel, an angel that is purely a magical or a fantastic category. Um, and the fetus floats, I quote from the book, uh, with a placidity that repudiates all past, all history, all repentance, unquote. Historical anchoring is well uh, demonstrated in what John Foster calls as felt history, right, where the characters can uh, experience the historical forces with their body, with all their senses and uh, all their sensibilities. So, this phenomenon is exaggerated and particularized in magical realist fiction. Some examples uh, could be uh, the coincidence of Salim's birth with that of the birth of the independent uh, nation of India. Lisa's pains that anticipate her death at Babiyar, Grenuel's magical nose that is born from the smells of uh, Renaissance Europe and the division of Fuentes's characters between uh, Latin America and Europe, right? The characters uh, are divided to, to, to represent uh, this, the, the Latin America and Europe. So, the material world is present in all of magical realism's detailed and concrete uh, variety as it is in the case of a realist work, but with some differences. One of them being that the objects may take on their own lives and their, uh, you know, uh, own destiny and thereby become magical proceeding beyond uh, both uh, descriptions and beyond familiar references. So, in 100 years of solitude, the yellow butterflies that appear in Mauricio Babylonia uh, and the basket in which Salim travels from Bangladesh to Bombay in Midnight's Children, um, the shiny spherical uh, object that young uh, Victor Heredia finds at the ruins of uh, Zoshikalko in distant relations, even the doors that uh, open at Philippe's touch in Fuentes's novel Aura, all of these are examples of magical objects that take on their own life in the narrative and uh, they follow their uh, own destiny. They have uh, a spirit of their own. They are not uh, after a point being guided by the author or the narrator. The materiality extends to the word objects that play as metaphors and uh, these word objects uh, take on a special uh, kind of uh, textual life. They become very three dimensional after a point uh, where the narrative has uh, uh, arrived and, and they keep uh, appearing and reappearing again and again in the narrative uh, until the weight of their verbal reality, uh, you know, becomes more than their referential function. They are no longer only verbal reality, they signify they uh, allude to more. So, Salim's spittoon and the sheet through which uh, Adam Aziz in Midnight's Children uh, examines his future wife Naseem uh, tend to function as magical objects uh, and even the tick on the tree branch uh, that, we, uh, that we find in perfume, uh, even the recurring uh, roses, breasts, uh, hotels and hair that keep uh, coming in the narrative of the white hotel. These are all examples of, uh, of, of uh, magical objects. 
So, magical realism comprises the part of surrealism that could be written down um, its textual poetics. So, it, it is not as remote to reality as surrealism. It is something that can be plotted and documented and um, they exploit to the fullest the magic of metaphor and foreground the enchanting quality of poetry, of poesy, uh, which uh, however defies any kind of uh, logic or uh, challenges reason. So, in taking poetics of defamiliarization to its extreme, uh, one can, one could say that uh, magical realism is uh, the, the, the uh, progenitor, the, it carries the, uh, it carries, it significantly carries the legacy of surrealism. Uh, however, in contrast to the magical images that are, cons uh, that are constructed by surrealism uh, out of ordinary objects, uh, which aim at uh, uh, appearing virtually unmotivated. So, they are there for the sake of magic for the sake of surreal and fantastic and, and uh, they programmatically resist any kind of interpretation. Uh, magical realist images on the other hand uh, do project a similar initial aura of uh, surprising craziness, but they do uh, have, uh, they, they do uh, play a role, uh, you know. Uh, as as uh, criticizing certain uh, certain aspects of a given society, so these uh, magically real elements, the magically realist uh, elements and and uh, modes of narration, have a, a, a key role uh, as social critic. They comment, uh, critic, and observe certain. Uh, certain aspects, certain functionings in a society. So, their real motivation, uh, you know, lies uh, in the psychological, the social, the emotional, the political, uh, which uh, reveal after certain scrutiny. So, they are not there only for the sake of the magic. They are also trying to comment on the real. So, for example, Franz Kafka and uh, Gromowitz uh, uh, actualize metaphors uh, through projecting inner states outward. So, they are making the inner on the outer as in the case of uh, Grigor Samsa. In the case of Kafka and uh, Gromowitz, we see uh, two kinds of tendencies. Kafka actualizes metaphors through projecting inner states outward through the character of Gregor Samsa, for example, uh, who, who metamorphoses into an insect and flies out of the window in the end, um, or public characterizations uh, are projected inward as in the case of Grombovics's uh, Pornographia where, uh, you know, uh, which as Gromovics uh, himself states, I quote, is the grotesque uh, story of a gentleman who becomes a child because other people treat him like a child, unquote. So, coming to the third characteristic or feature of the magical realist writing, the reader may hesitate uh, at one point or another uh, between two contradictory understandings of a given event and uh, this leads to experiencing some kind of unsettling doubts. Uh, much of magical realism is encompassed by Tizel Witten Todorov's well-known formulation of uh, the fantastic as existing during a story. When the reader is in two minds hesitating between the uncanny as events uh, defy explanation according to the laws of the natural uh, universe and also uh, the marvelous which requires certain alteration of these laws. So, the reader's primary doubt in most cases is between understanding an event uh, as a character's 
a hallucination or as a miracle. So, it takes the reader a while to understand whether an event is part of a character's hallucination or if it is indeed a miracle. So, we are going to uh, draw an example from the beloved and stop our lecture here. The mysterious character of beloved in Toni Morrison's uh, novel Beloved slithers provokingly between uh, the two options that we just now mentioned, the uncanny and the marvelous, uh, whether it is a character's hallucination or if it is indeed a miracle. Uh, it plays with our rationalist tendencies to recuperate and to uh, co-opt uh, the marvelous. The women outside Sithi's house ask themselves, was it the dead daughter come back or a pretend? Was it whipping Siti? A bit farther on, the novel tells readers, Paul D. knows beloved is truly gone, disappeared, some say, exploded right before their eyes. Ella is not so sure. Maybe, she says, maybe not. Could be hiding in the trees waiting for another chance. Unquote. So, I would like to stop our discussion here today. And let us meet with another round of uh, discussions in, in our uh, next lecture. Thank you.